Anyway, let's go ahead and get into Philippians here. Philippians chapter 2, we're in a really uh, wonderful text today. We're going to pick it up in verse 5 here in a, in a moment. Uh, when Moravian missionaries went with the gospel message to the West Indies, it was almost, they found, impossible to reach uh, the nationals there because at the break of day, these, these natives at that point in time were being driven to their hard work uh, where they would remain almost until nightfall, dark, dusk. And then they'd come home and they would eat their coarse meal and immediately go basically fall into bed exhausted. And so they never had the opportunity to reach them like they, they wanted to do. So after a lot of prayer, what they decided they needed to do is these missionaries decided to enter into slavery alongside of these uh, natives. They, they made themselves slaves so that they could take the gospel of Christ to these nationals. And that story uh, really illustrates the, the self-denial uh, that, that God expects of us uh, as it relates to each other. Uh, a humility, and, and that's what we're looking at uh, in, in the text today. The most, one of the most powerful texts on, on the, the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we looked at the need, we started looking at the need of dealing with the obstacle of self, of our, of our own self as it relates to our relationships and, and, and our dealings with one another. If we, want to, if we want to have joy and we don't want people to, to rob us of our joy, the reality is it's not the people who rob us of our joy, it's our self-exaltation the inability of ourselves to deal with this obstacle of ourself and get out of the way. And that, that's where Paul was taking us last week. Well, the, the passage at hand we're looking at is, is the greatest example uh, of humility and total selflessness in, in the Word of God. And that example is the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One who, uh, in, in whom there was never... Uh, an obstacle of self. It was never there uh, in him uh, because he thought only of others. Uh, and we're going to see that. And it's through this, uh, this example that, that's set forth here. And, and I have to say this, the purpose of this isn't to teach necessarily uh, Christology, you know, doctrines as it relates to Christ. Because this passage is called the kenosis passage. In the language, it's kenosis. It means self-emptying. And we get a lot of our theology there. But what you have to understand is this is being presented to us as an example. He set down by his actual act of, of selflessness and humility to become our Lord and Savior he serves as a model that we're to pattern our dealings with each other after. So that's what's here. It, it's not, it, does it teach the kenosis and what he did? Absolutely. Will we look at that? Yes. But don't miss the point here. The point is about us. It's about have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what it's about. So what, he, what we're dealing with is, is don't go out of here. I mean, you're going to go out of here. I did. Every time I read it, uh, I glory in, in, in how much he gave up and loved us to do what he did. But the point is, do the same toward each other in your dealings with each other. And have this. So that's what we're looking at in bringing this example. And what we learn is that as Christians, as Christians, we're to follow Christ's example of humility in our relationships with others. We defined last time humility as not thinking lowly of yourself, but rather not thinking of self at all. That's the truly humble person who understands it's not about me at all. It's about the Lord. It's about the Lord. And if I'm about the Lord, then I'm going to follow His example and put others' interests above my own. Because that's exactly what He did. 
This was his example. And as we look at Christ today, this kenosis passage is self-emptying. What we're going to see is four characteristics that are given to us that belong to the truly humble uh, man. The truly humble person. Uh, and really, they belonged to Christ. Uh, he's the example. So I want to go ahead now and get into this text. And I want to look at first the characteristics. The first characteristic, I should say, seen in Christ that testifies uh, of true humility and selflessness. The first characteristic of the truly humble is a willingness to set aside personal interests or glory for the interests of others. It's a willingness to set aside personal glory or interests for the, the interests of others. Look at verses 5 through 6. I'm going to read it all and then I'll back up because I like us to get it all. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, back to the, the characteristic, the first one. Willingness to set aside personal glory or interest for the interests of others. And that's verses 5 and 6, which we just read. The question is, is when was the last time, we should ask, when was the last time you stepped back in the shadows in order to see someone else shine? Now, I'm not saying that's humility it, it, it directly, but that's kind of what, what it is. It, it is. it is backing up and, and helping others, pushing them, not pushing them, but letting them shine, putting their interests above them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to be in the shadows. There's that song, uh, what's his name, Roger Whitaker did, uh, You're the Wind Beneath My Wings. It conveys that same idea. And I'm going to tell you, the truly humble person looks at other people that way. And looks at what God might do in their lives. Now, you may have and possess a gift they need, and the truly humble person is going to embrace that gift and use that gift for the needs of others, not for self-glorification. And what we see with, with Christ here is that's, that's what He did. He, we're, we're admonished to have this attitude in ourselves. I believe one of the greatest obstacles of, of being used of God, seriously, is the fact that we think too highly of ourselves oftentimes to really be used of God. We feel that we're something special, that we have something to offer God and others, when in reality, that's nothing more than pride and self-glorification. We think we're something special, so much so that we don't step up to be used. Our, our interests over others' interests are often what takes place. And I see that a lot. I'll be honest with you as pastors uh, and even it, within any, any church because that's the nature of, of fallen man is, is we tend to make everything about ourselves and not others. And that is not the example of Christ. It's not. It's not at all. In fact, it's, He placed others' interests ahead of his own, and on a level you and I can never possibly really fathom this side of glory. But it's conveyed to us nonetheless. What in reality do we have, when you think about it, to glory in as saved people who know the Lord other than Christ Jesus himself? That's what Paul tells us. That's what it's about. We don't have anything to boast in, in ourselves. It's all what he did. Vance Havner put, put this whole idea this way. And I love this. He said, few of us are big enough to become little enough to be used of God. That's powerful. Few of us are big enough to become little enough to be used of God. What are we talking about? Getting out of the way. Getting ourselves out of the way. 
Letting God use us in whatever capacity, putting others ahead of ourselves, and letting God be the one who places us and uses us for His glory as we impact others' lives. That's what it's about. Now, Jesus, when we look at this, He's the exception. He's the exception in, in, in a way, like I said, that we can't even get there. He's the perfect, the perfect example of one who willingly set aside his interests for the interests of others. Now here's the question, what did he set aside? And this is the mind blower. This is where it gets really amazing when you consider it. What he did, what our Lord did. And, I, and as I said... It's far more than we can fathom. I've, I've, over the years, I've had to wrestle with this text. I've taught this uh, multiple times. I mean, I've been in the ministry now over 25, 26 years now. And uh, you're, you're going to deal with the kenosis in, in all kinds of contexts. And I have yet, I have yet, in all my reading and all the illustration books, you name it, I cannot find an illustration that can even come close to illustrating what we're, what we're looking at in this, this text today as it relates to what Jesus gave up. Look at, verse, look at verse 6 and marvel at this. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus who although He existence in the, existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. The word is clutched, to be held on to, to be, to be clung to. That's what the idea is here. What, what it's saying is, is simply and wonderfully this. That Jesus Christ, although God in every essence, that's what the word is. Not existence in the essence or in the sense of like God. But in every essence that God is, he, ex he was that. He is that. He's God. But He gave that totally equal with God. He did not regard that as something to be clung to selfishly. But yet He, he let it go. Kenosis, the word here. Uh, ek kenoben. He gave it up. The root word kenosis. Kenosin, I mean. He gave that up. Emptying Himself of it. And here's, here's why. For you. For me. See, that's how it should be. You should be sitting here thinking, wow. We're talking the creator of the universe. We're talking about God Himself in the person of, of Christ, the second person of the one triune God, setting aside His interests as deity, in order to embrace this life, to live a life, so, so that you and I might have life. That's amazing. You can't illustrate that. I mean, you just can't. I mean, I mean you could say, okay, it would be like, if, if ants could be saved, that you would become an ant. <laughs> Maybe. And even that is inadequate, because you didn't create the ants. He's the creator of it all. He's the one who holds it all together according to Colossians 1. He, he's the one who, 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 who literally, by His Word, it was all formed, all created, the entire universe. And He emptied Himself of that. He gave it up for us. I realize that when you look at this passage, and I have to say this, or you might think I'm negligent in this, and, I'm, and I don't want to be, and that is, is that it depends on the translation that you're holding this morning. Uh, there seems to be discrepancy as to the, the, the intent of the passage. If you have a King James Version, it reads, He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The NASV, the New American Standard Bible, and the NIV, it, 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 it conveys, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or clutched. And the first one gives the idea that, that he didn't think it was bad to be 
equal with God. That's not what the context bears out. And I'm not going to go into all of the, the exegesis behind this because I think the context really clarifies the intent here. And I think that actually the New American Standard captures it uh, the, the best way in that the clutching. Because what, we're have, what we have is the kenosis. He let go. He emptied himself of that. Now what did he empty himself of? What he emptied himself is the independent use of his attributes and his visible glory. He set it aside. Now to me, as I moved through this this time around, it was very powerful because I'm teaching the life of Christ in Sunday school class. We're using Dwight Pentecost's book, uh, the, the, the Words and the Deeds of Christ. It's, it's a, the, a life, the Life of Christ study. And we're looking through all the Gospels and, all of, uh, and placing it in time and what was taking place. And we just came out of the Transfiguration. And when you think about what he gave up, just as it relates to his visible glory, is mind-blowing. Uh, it's mind-boggling. Because the, the transfiguration passages, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, they, they convey that his appearance changed on that mountain. And it said his face shone as the sun. His, his body, his clothing was so radiant, it was described as a lightning, as almost a lightning flash. And, his, and, and as, uh, as white, whiter than any launderer could possibly make white, that was his appearance. What he showed them on that mountain at that moment in time, he revealed to them who he was. And that is he's the Son of God. He was the Messiah. He let those three disciples, the three that went up on the mountain with him, Peter, John, and Andrew, he let them see this. And guess what they did? They hit the ground. They hit the ground. John was given a glimpse in the vision when he turned to see who was talking to him on the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation. And, it, and that, that vivid description of Christ given in his appearance and what, what happened to John when he, when he was confronted with him in his glory? He hit the ground. That majestic radiance of, of just the visible glory of Christ, those moments where they were allowed to see this, it put them on their faces. He set that aside. He set that aside. He set aside the independent use of his attributes. What do we mean by that? We mean the, 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 the ability to do all that you can do as God. He submitted Himself. Could He do those at any point? Yeah, He's, he's the Son of God. He's the second person, the one triune God, but He set it aside. Now you need to think about that, folks. You need to realize that He set this aside for you. For me. He placed... My interest. What was my interest? I'm damned and headed for hell. You were. And he cared. And he placed our interests, what was needed for us, ahead of holding on to, to those things. He set those aside to embrace time and, and, and flesh. And he came down. We'll get more into that in a moment. He set it aside for us. The humble person, he, he, what we're seeing here, the humble person is one whose personal interests, whose personal interests are set aside for the interests of others. And I'm going to tell you, there's not, a whole, there's not a whole lot of believers who do that. And that's facts. And I'm not saying, I mean, I, we'll do it at moment. Now, don't get me wrong, I think we do it at different points in our, in our lives. And that's, that's how we can look at it. But I'm talking who live their lives with an attitude where other people's interests are ahead of their own. That, that what, what's going on in their lives, it even trumps what's going on in mine. Where I care more about what the Lord would have me be and do for people than what 
what's going on here. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people today in the church, it's all about me. They come to church for what they can get. They don't come to be equipped so that they can serve. And see, the body is meant to be a place where, I mean, the church is meant to be a place where you're, you're trained in the truth and the Word of God, so you can go out and be Christ in people's lives. You can go out and minister and have an impact for the glory of the Lord, not your own. Not your own. You see, here's another thing. We do things, and praise God, we have a lot of people in our church who do things and they never get lauded for them. But oftentimes, we'll do things, we want the praise. We want it known. That I did these things. And that's not the humble person. The humble person, the humble person does what's necessary and thinks of the others above their own interests. And that's the first thing we see with Christ. Now, the second characteristic of the truly humble and selfless person is he willfully serves. Look at 7a. Look at what it says here. But emptied himself, there's that kenosis, emptied himself, taking the form of a bond. Servant, a bond servant. So, so what did he give up? Well, he went from second person of the one triune God to enter this life to do what? To serve. That's what he did. He came to serve, not to be served, but to serve. Most of us like to think of ourselves as as a, as as above certain things, but there like there's limits. There's limits to our humility. I'll do this, but I won't do that. Well, when you look at Christ, there's no lower than you can go than becoming a bondservant when you think of the self-emptying. Because what was He before that? He's the Lord God. Where do you go? What, how, how far can you condescend? Well, if you're the Creator, Sovereign of the universe, the, 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 the lowest position as a human being or a person would be to enter into a bond servant state. And that's exactly what he did. That's what he did. The example of Christ, when you look at his life, which we've been going through, if you've noticed this in the Gospels, that it's Jesus who serves others and not others who serve him. Rarely do you see Jesus being served. There are those who recognize him who recognized Him as Messiah and worshipped Him and served Him in certain moments. But when you look at His overall existence among us, and specifically during the last three years of His life where He was engaged in His public ministry, He, he was on call to everybody. Fishermen, harlots, tax collectors, demon-possessed, diseased, crippled, defiled. He ministered to all of them. He served them all. Earlier I said, I'll do this, but I won't do that. That's a lot of the times how we want our service to be. We'll, we'll serve if it fits me. Or quote, suits me. He plugged in to some of the people, we just we we went through this. Some of these folks I'm talking about, the, the, the diseased, the lepers, the harlots, those people, they were the bane of society. You weren't supposed to associate with them, you weren't supposed to touch them. And here's our Lord, He would lay His hands on the leper. Totally forbidden act for somebody of His stature to lay His hand because he, he, He's defiled now, He's unclean. The heart of the Lord was to serve. He served as a bondservant. And not only did He serve others, He served the Lord, the Father. Subjected Himself fully to the Father's will. To me, that's not a hard one because His will is exactly the will of the Father. But the beauty of it is, is He entered into the incarnate state. He took on flesh, which we'll get to in a moment, which to me is mind-blowing. But he, he took on flesh and entered into a state with the Father as a son would submit to his Father's authority, he entered into that. And he submitted in the, in the human experience, moment by moment, to, to the Lord's authority. 
There were no limits to his humility in service. Not, not with our Lord. Even to the, 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 the washing, remember that one, the washing of the feet of the disciples. Here's, here again, folks, think about it. Think about that. Here is the creator of the universe who's washing the feet of men. You want to talk about humility? That's humility. That's humility. That's the example he set forth for us. So that's the second. Third characteristic of the truly humble and selfless uh, person he willingly sacrifices 7b through 8. Now we get into the depths of the, con the, the condescension of our Lord. 7b, look at it. He, he became a form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The sacrifices of Christ are... are they are unfathomable. We can state them because they can be put in words. God put them in words. But to get there, I don't know that we can fully grasp it, but we can meditate upon it, and that's, that's Paul's intent. But the reality is, is we're being taught here. And he willingly did this. He made major, major sacrifices. Major sacrifices in the interests of others. We see in these verses the steps of Christ's condescension. Let's look at him here. First, he emptied himself of his visible glory and independent use of his attributes. We've already considered that. Second, he became a servant, a bond servant. He entered, went from the Lord, the master, God, to a bond servant in, in uh, status, and he became flesh. He became flesh, a man. Mind you, not for a moment in time, but how long? Permanently. There is one mediator between God and man. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, and that is what? The man, Christ Jesus. He took on flesh. He partook of all that we are. He... he put our interests above his own, and it meant becoming flesh. He took that body, in the, in the steps here, he took that body to the cross. And he willingly experienced death, and, and it's stated in here, even death on a cross. Why emphasize that? Because that was the lowest form you could... I mean, if you are going to die, that was the worst possible way to die. Not in the suffering aspect of it, which was horrendous in itself, but what it signified. Because we're told in the Old Testament, cursed is everyone who hangs, what? On a tree. The vilest people, the vilest people in society, were put on a cross as a symbol of how vile they were. So he took and he condescended to, for us, in our interest, he did this, and it led him to a cross where he would ultimately die a criminal, the most vile criminal's death. That's how far he was willing to sacrifice for you and I. That's what he was willing to do. Understand that this was not only physical death, by the way, but spiritual. What do you mean? Well, I'll tell you. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. What's that? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said that on the cross. For that one moment, and I'm telling you, it wasn't, it was just that one moment, folks. I'm not saying he went to hell, but he experienced hell in that one moment. In a way that you and I can never possibly ever get, get there. You say, well, why is that? Because he existed in perfect unity 
with the Father and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. They're one. But He became sin. He condescended for you and me. Why did He do it? Why did He do it? Verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. What did He do? He didn't, the verse leading into it, He placed others' interests above His own. And it led Him to that place. That's where it would end for Him. That's the depths of the condescension that he experienced. It was for us. A truly humble person is willing to sacrifice for others. Willing to sacrifice for others. How many of us are truly willing to sacrifice for others? I'm going to tell you. We all get here, and it's a cruddy attitude. But I know how it is. At times, you're so pressed upon in your own world and your own doings that when somebody comes in with need, rather than look at the need and feel sympathy or compassion and place that person's interests on a level where you even give it considerations, you look away in disgust with why do I have to deal with this at this point? You get angry that, that there's an intrusion into what I'm about and we don't minister. And Christ's heart was not that. He would become exhausted in, in the flesh, in His incarnate state, to the place He would remove Himself from the multitudes because He was just exhausted. He was drained. He needed to get alone with, his, with the Father. But it wasn't because He was disgusted with people because they were intruding. That, that, uh, he cared. And that's the example He set for us. Sacrificing means sacrifice. It means saying, you know what? I am not going to do this so that I can do this. Or I might not buy this so that I can give this to this need, this ministry, this place. How do we, how do we think? Do we think that way? That's the example. And I'm going to tell you, as the bar said high, <laughs> you can't set it any higher. I mean, I'm being honest with you. How do you get any higher than the example of Christ? You can't. You can't. So can we do this in perfection? No. But what we need to do is we need to understand that God's expectation is that we cultivate that attitude in our dealings with others. And in the context of Philippians, if you want joy, if you truly want joy to where people don't get in there and uproot that and... and, and, and Tip it, tip it upside down on you, then get out of the way. That's what Paul's saying. Quit making it about you all the time and you're not going to have your joy go out the window every time somebody doesn't do what you think they ought to be doing or whatever. You just start caring about people and then pretty soon that joy's untouchable as it relates to people because you're not looking them as, as a burden but as an avenue to represent Christ. And, and to minister for the Lord. Let's look at the fourth characteristic now of the, of the truly humble. And it is this. It's a willingness or a desire to glorify God. He brings glory to God. That's, that's what's in this last part, but there's a twist to it, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there in a moment. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and then get the last clause, to the glory of God the Father. So all that Jesus does, place in others' interests above his own, that was for us to have life, but in all of it, this, this yielded submissiveness, bondservant uh, attitude toward the Father's will was all ultimately to turn it around that the Father, in the end, would be what? Receive the glory. Would receive the glory. See, we want our share of it. Christ didn't really care about getting it. But the beauty of it, the twist is, what happened? We sang it in the chorus. We read it right here. God the Father, because of what? His, hum, his humility, what He did, the Father does what to Him? He exalts it. Praise God. Can't, can't, I can't wait for the day 
that every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That everybody has to admit exactly what you and I have embraced in this life is that He is the Son of God. And the Father's the one who brings it about. Jesus didn't do it for that reason. That's the beauty in the Godhead, by the way. I love that. You got the Father. Okay, you got the Father. Then you got the Son. The Son does what He does in submission to the Father as He entered the, the incarnate state, took on flesh, and, and, and condescended, emptied Himself. The kenosis here. He does it for the glory of, of, of the Father. The Father turns around and exalts the Son. But He also, the Spirit of God, is left on this earth to constantly do what? Turn everybody back to Jesus. They, they're, 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 even within the context of the unique Trinity, it's not about any one person specifically, it's about the other. The, their glory, their glorification, their exaltation. It, it's just amazing when you think about it. But that's the example of Christ to us even in life is that we should be concerned about the glory of the Father. And if we truly are, then we'll bring our lives into a humble state to where we can minister in a way that represents that attitude that He showed toward us in placing our interests above His own. And when we do that, when we do that, the Father is glorified. And guess what? When we humble ourselves, the day's coming, folks, when He will lift us up. But we don't do it for that reason. That's just the icing on the cake. He turns right around and exalts us. He lifts us up as we yield to Him and His purposes. Andrew, Andrew Murray stated this, Here's the path to the higher life. Down, lower down. This was what Christ taught the disciples when they were thinking of being the greatest in the kingdom. Do not seek or ask for exaltation. That is God's work. It's God who exalts. And as Christ Jesus willingly humbled Himself, He will surely one day be recognized and lifted up for who He is. And that's what those, the, the closing verses uh, bless us with. Praise God. Jesus, high and lifted up to the glory of the Father. I want to close this whole thing by reading verse 5 again. When you look at all this, and I, and I started with this, this is powerful as it relates to what we learn about our Lord. But the whole point that Paul brings Christ up is that we'll have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. I said the mark is, is as high as it can be. The standard is as high as it's going to be. But if you're going to have a model, don't you want the best? If you're going to shoot for something in life, you're going to put the mediocre as your target? That's easy. You know, you could, you could pick a person in the church. I want to be like that one or I want to be like that one. Praise God, you, you, ought to, you ought to follow the godly ones as examples. But if you're, going to put a, if you're going to put a target up there, if you're, going to, if you're going to have a goal, and that ought to be the way it is in life, if you're going to set a goal, set a good one. And the best one, the best one, as it relates to humility, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let Him be the benchmark. And here's the beauty of it, and I share this every time, because oftentimes you walk out of here, and I've done it too, in my own personal study, I felt totally deflated, totally defeated, because how can I ever get there? I can't. You can't. But the beauty is, is Paul wouldn't tell us to have this attitude if it wasn't something that was attainable it, 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 as it relates to what our character is. Are we going to fail? We're going to fail. We're not Jesus. We're not the Son of God. But we're sons of God. Aren't we? So we ought to reflect our Lord in our dealings with others. And it starts with this humility. You want your joy to be intact as it relates to people? This is it.
Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage, Lord. And every time, Lord, I go through it, I feel I do it a, a disservice because it is so lofty. It is so powerful as to what is represented here as it relates to what our Lord set aside for our interests. But yet by your Spirit, Lord, I pray that the message, the example of Christ would be brought to bear upon our hearts. But more than that, that that example would become the target as we live lives, that we would truly strive to have that attitude in ourselves, which was also in our Lord. May we deal with one another in that manner and realize full joy, even as it relates to our relationships with people. Lord, that, that, that the people wouldn't become those robbers of our joy when in reality it's, it's our own fault because we're not willing to become humble, to be like our Lord. Bless each one this day, Lord, for being out. I pray that you bless your word to each of our hearts. Bless the fellowship we might enjoy with one another this day. I, I, I think of our... our uh, VBS preparations this afternoon, may that be well attended and uh, may the work go speedily and, and uh, truly be blessed. And uh, we're looking ahead even toward the uh, VBS itself and asking your blessing with uh, many young people, Lord, this year that we might be able to share the gospel with them. But bless each one, Lord, for being out now. Go with us into the week ahead and help us truly to reflect our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as we deal with others. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.